All right, welcome back to CS4510, lecture 15B. This is the second half of the, our little break. Uh, the title of today's lecture is on a class called NP, which uh, stands for non-deterministic uh, polynomial time. Real mouth. Full there really commands full use of the tongue. Non-deterministic polynomial time. Say that three times fast. Uh, recall what non-determinism is. Like it's all that weird stuff, right? For the for the NFAs, we are able to prove that uh, they're equivalent to the DFAs. But you have something like this, some analogy, right? You come to a fork in the road, uh, and the machine somehow has the has the otherworldly pre premonition to know which decision it's going to make. A deterministic Turing machine only has just, well, in, in a simplified example here, the DFA only has one selection. Uh, it's you given a, de a deterministic machine, you give it your input and the program specification, you run it, and then it goes on, and each step is uniquely defined from the previous. But in a non-deterministic term machine, there's more than one quote-unquote choice it's allowed to make, and somehow it knows how to make the choice. And we made some analogies with that, like maybe there's a lucky coin that tells us which, which way to go. Um, so that's what a non that's recall that's what a non-deterministic Turing machine is. It has it, this ability to make uh, non-deterministic uh, non-deterministic choices. And the class NP is quite literally just going to be defined as uh, the class of languages which is decidable um, in a non-deterministic Turing machine which halts in a polynomial number of steps. Right. So now we have to be a little careful on halts. Right. So like. Uh, a non-deterministic non -deterministic Turing machine has many computational branches, right? Uh, it has to halt in a polynomial number on all of them, basically. Not just the accepting one. But you got a definition of uh, NP from algorithms, right? The, today, my goal is to prove to you, the, the, along, among other characterizations of NP, those two definitions are equivalent. So in algorithms, you learned that NP, and I'm going to call this NP uh, underscore V. Uh, NP underscore V is the class of languages verifiable in polynomial time. There exists an algorithm that can verify a solution to a problem. It doesn't have to find the solution, but given the solution, it can check it if it's correct or not. Um, so like, uh, like, let's say some A is in NP V. Uh, if... Uh, like, uh, there exists a poly time verif poly time verifier, and I'll say deterministic verifier just to be explicit, uh, such that like some W is in A, if and only if, uh, there exists a certificate C such that the verifier grades the witness, grades the certificate and says yes. So like uh, if a language is an NPV, which we're going to later prove is NP, uh, if a language is an NPV, it's deterministic, there exists a deterministic verifier for the, the, the problem. It's able to, there exists a, thi there exists a, uh, algorithm which maybe can't solve it in polynomial time, but is able to grade it in polynomial time. So, like, checking a solution is a very different problem than finding a solution. You know, that's why I love not being in college anymore and being on the other side of it because I can make up problems and not worry about if they're even solvable or not. That's that's your job of the homework. I just kind of, you know, I get that um, that privilege. And then I I don't know if a problem's solvable or not. And I just give it out to people, and then they then I can check the solution because that might be easier than finding the solution, right? So checking a solution is certainly easier. And there is a sort of mis mystique here because there's no, there's no information on how you would find this such, such a solution. It's not, it's not the job of the verifier to find the solution. The job of the verifier is simply a grader. Um, so some examples of like where the complexity might differ between solving and verifying is uh, per perhaps not by much, but if you consider finding the root of a polynomial, right? Finding the root of a quadratic polynomial, you have to use the quadratic formula. There's some math moving around. Finding the root of a quadratic polynomial, a quadratic, of a quadratic 
verifying the root of a quadratic is easy. How do you verify the root of a quadratic? Just plug it in. You plug and chug, and then if it's zero, it was a root. That's much easier than applying the quadratic formula. And true for higher degree polynomials. I think even I think finding root finding though of polynomials is in, is, is in p though. So that'll matter when we compare p to n p um, later. There are some things that of course that appear to be in that are easy to verify. You know, SAT for example. We talk about SAT. We'll talk extensively about that as well. But finding a SAT solution, there doesn't appear to be a sub exponential time algorithm. It's called the exponential time hypothesis. But there also doesn't appear to be. Uh, but we can verify solutions and. The same ways that we talked about the quadratic formula. You plug in the assignment of the variables, and somehow out comes a, yes, a 0 or 1. Um, so NPV is what I'm calling temporarily the class of languages which is verifiable at bottom of the time. And this is what you should be used to from 3510. In 4510, this course, NP is the class of, this, of these magic machines which have access, which halt in a polynomial number of steps. Um, but in algorithms, in the real world, you're concerned with deterministic <laughs> verifiers because the deterministic verifiers are those which are like real devices and things that you're, you're concerned with the study of, um, you know, like practical things, not this magic nonsense. Uh, and then some books, I've, I, I noticed they don't even really, they mention this equivalence, but they don't care about the, the non-deterministic, um, the, like the magic part. It's, it's not in the spirit of the way they, they, they view complexity. So I want to prove these two are equal, right? So I want to prove that NP equals NPV, right? So what we're going to do is going to do a double set containment, a double set containment. So the way we're going to do a double set containment is prove one must be in the other and the other must be in one. So of course, let's just do one of them first. Which way did I want to do first? Okay, I'm going to prove that if a language is verifiable in polynomial time, then it must, it, there must exist a non-deterministic Turing machine which can decide it in polynomial time. So first we're going to prove this containment, okay? So what does it mean for, a, we want to pick an element in here, any element in here, and show it must be in here, right? So let A be any language which is an NPV, okay? So I should be maybe explicit with this proof. Let uh, A be in NPV. Uh, then, uh, then there exists a polytime a verifier V, which uh, halts in n to the k. We'll say O of n to the k steps. Uh, so we know that A, if, if A is in NPV, then we know there exists a polynomial time verifier, which can verify the language in n to the k steps, right? Uh, what is a non-deterministic algorithm, polynomial time algorithm, to solve this problem instead of verify the problem? Is that where you're discussing, Chuck? Yes, but we're going to non-deterministically guess and check. So we're going to use the magic of non-determinism to prove, uh, basically, we're going to just non-deterministically guess the certificate. Here we have to search for this. We don't have to search for the certificate. It's not mentioned how you get the certificate. But if you can just guess the certificate correctly, non-deterministically you've guessed the certificate, congrats. You now just have the certificate and the polynomial time verifier. If you have the certificate and the verifier, that's just an algorithm. It relies on non-determinism to get the certificate, but that's fine, because we're trying to show it's an NP, not in P, but just NP. So we say N on input uh, W, uh, guess the certificate C of size, like uh, no more than like N to the K, right? Because that's the size the algorithm runs in. We don't want, uh, the, it's never really mentioned, but the, the, the verifier runs in polynomial time, it can't look at a certificate that's larger than polynomial, right? It has to look at the, the certificate has to be of polynomial size as well. So we're going to guess the certificate of polynomial size. Um, okay, we're going to run uh, V 
on input W and certificate C. If it accepts, accept. I could just say return V and C, okay? So this is clearly a non-deterministic algorithm. Uh, why? Uh, we're non-deterministically guessing this. I just didn't have room for this, but I should have written the non-deterministic LE. Totally readable, promise. Non-deterministically guess C of size n to the k. So you just guess the witness. Congrats. You've guessed the solution, um, and then you've, that means you've solved the problem. Uh, I like this, this direction of the proof. is pretty interesting because it really shows the power of non-determinism. When you decide a non-deterministic algorithm, you get to just say, you get this power. If you have something that you would rather, that you don't really want the, to spend the time to search for, you can just say, guess it. I'm going to guess it. And somehow the machine has the premonition to know what, what the right answer is. Right? It has these lucky coins to tell it uh, which direction to go. It's slightly more of a generalization than the kind of non-determinism we got from the NFAs. It's like similar like the C, it's more like the CFG knows how to guess the middle or something. The non-deterministic Turing machine is a very unwieldy device. It's very uh, scary even, I should say. All right, so we've proven one way. Any, well, oh, first off, this is non-deterministic, fine. It runs in polynomial time. Why? V runs in polynomial time. Guessing the certificate, this, we can put a cost to the non-determinism if we, if we want. It's going to be polynomial because it, it guesses an object of polynomial size. It's going to run polynomial time. It's an NP. Right. Um, let's do the other way. Let's prove that if an algorithm, if we'll prove that uh, uh, any, any language which is solvable in non-deterministic polynomial time has to be verifiable in deterministic polynomial time. So how are we going to do this? Um, let uh, A be in NP. And if A is in NP, then there exists uh, NTM uh, N, which runs in, I don't know, let's say O of N to the K steps uh, to decide uh, A. What would a deterministic verifier look like for this non-deterministically solvable uh, algorithm? This has a similar trick to the previous one, where it's about the. It's really the difference between these two is really about the witness, right? So what is a? We're trying to prove it's in here. So give me a deterministic verifier for a non-deterministic solver. To guess? Yes. Okay. Oh, is that, is that your answer? Yeah. Mm, close enough. The, 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 the non-deterministic Turing machine is allowed to make guesses. Uh, so we would like to simulate this non-deterministic Turing machine with polynomial overhead deterministically. The problem is we come to the fork in the road. We don't know which decision to make. That's what makes the simulation expensive. So what you do is you just use the witness as the selection of choices. Which, which path you go. If you have like a fork in the road like this, say something like this, okay? Some kind of non-deterministic thing. You can use the bits of the witness to determine which way do you go. You go that way, and then you go that way, or something, right? It just somehow you, the, the power, deterministically verifiable computations still have a power. They're given, this, they're given an answer, okay? We just say the answer in SAT is the, is the assignment. In coloring, it's the three coloring, whatever. Here, the answer is going to be the selection of non-deterministic choices. That's all we're going to say. So we're going to say uh, V on input, uh, W and C, right? So the, that's the, really the catch. It gets W and it gets C. That was, makes it a verifier, not a solver. Let me make sure I get this exact. Uh, simulate n, n deterministically. Deterministically. 
So if the if the non-deterministic Dury machine makes deterministic moves, it's fine. You can simulate it. But if it comes to uh, a non-deterministic move, you have to uh, make a choice. So basically, like uh, on uh, a non-deterministic move, use first bits of C to make uh, the choice, right? So C is going to be a sequence of bits. It's an input, polynomial size, of course. Uh, your non-deterministic Turing machine is going to make um, some choices, right? If the first bit is a zero, maybe that means it goes up. Then it's here. It's like, oh, magic coin. What is my? Where do I go? You know, uh, first bit is now a one. It goes down, and so on, right? Something like this is going to occur. Uh, and it just uses C as an advice. If C is the wrong advice, fine. The d definition d doesn't say that the witness given has to be correct. You can grade a wrong answer and just say that, okay, your answer was trash, right? But as long as there exists a correct answer, the verifier runs in polynomial time and is correct. So you, assume that the, you, as you get to assume implicitly here that the answer is correct. So just assume that the answer is the selection of non-deterministic choices. That's, a, that's, a, that's an insanely... Um, that's a very strong jump here, right? It, it really makes clear that NP, that the power of having an answer makes it very different than P, at least. Um, right, so now we've proven that NP is equal to NPV, right? We've done this double set containment. Um, and I am going to drop the V. So when I refer to the class NP, I'm referring to deterministically verifiable, as you may have seen in algorithms, but also magic guessing. And which one you want to do is up to you. In, in the spirit of the thing, you're working with an NP, you can say, well, I'm just going to guess this answer or so on, right? Um, right. Any questions on this proof? We have a good idea of what NP is now. But we don't have a good idea of the relationship of NP to some of the other classes. So uh, let's do the first half of what is supposed to be a really hard problem. I'm going to prove that P is a subset of NP. That is kind of easy. And we're actually going to do two definitions. I'm actually going to prove uh, both ways. P is a subset of NPV, right, as well. So P is also a subset of NP, and P is also a subset of the deterministically verifiable languages, right? Why is the first one true? So to make sure we know what the question, P, I'm asking you to prove P is a subset of NP. P, class of deterministic solvable languages in polynomial time, NP, class of non-deterministically solvable languages in polynomial time. Why is P a subset of NP? If you have a polynomial time algorithm, I mean, certainly you have an exponential algorithm because that's slower. When we get under the knife here, there is a difference between NP and XP. Well, we don't know. Again, this is complexity. We don't know if there is a difference. So although it is, in an algorithm's perspective, it is great to characterize uh, NP as exponential time algorithms because the best algorithms for SAT are still exponential. We can't say that here, right? That is, there is, a, there is an easier answer, though, it turns out. So if you say, and maybe you're not allowed to say this either, but could you say that the answer to a pre-problem is, is some collection of bits? So if you just flip enough bits, you would get the answer, and that would still be an NP. There's an easier answer. I'll have to think about that one. Basically, the, the answer that I'm looking for is like, P is a subset of NP for the same reason every DFA is an NFA. The generalization of non-determinism, right?
If you have an alg- if, if you have a language in NP, then there exists a polynomial time algorithm, polynomial time deterministic Turing machine. Every polynomial time deterministic Turing machine is also a non-deterministic Turing machine. Technically, it just doesn't use deterministic actions. So, certainly, it's an NP. Okay. Why is NP? Why is P the subset of NPV? And NP here again is deterministically verifiable, so there's no magic going on. Uh, this is a problem solvable in polynomial time. This is a problem verifiable in polynomial time. So suppose you have a problem which is solvable in polynomial time. Give me a polynomial time verifier. Couldn't you just say the, since you solved it, you know it's correct, so you verified it already? Basically. Like, the way I would word that is I would say, uh, verifier uh, V ignores witness. What is that? It's just an algorithm. So you can convert any algorithm into a verifier by just adding the parameter. I mean, you can go like F of N to F of N comma C, and then you ignore C, right? You just change the function header. Congrats, it's technically a verifier and not a uh, a solver. The verifier can solve, if the verifier just redoes your homework for you, it technically did verify the problem, right? Terrible auto grader, but that's, that's possible. Um, again, kind of ridiculously simple. Now, if the reverse is true or not true, or if the containment is strict, of course, it's a very difficult problem. So it's kind of funny that we get to say, prove easily how the one direction of the problem is. The other direction is, is, is um, you know, insane and arcane and stuff. Um, I'm going to spend the rest of today talking about um, just a lot of complexity classes because there's really, um, you know, there's, there's like more classes than Pokemon. There's just too many uh, names to go around. So I just want to talk about some of the names. So we have P space, which is another important class. And who can guess what this class is? What is this class? Polynomial space? Yes. Algorithm solvable in polynomial space. Deterministic polynomial space. We could do NP space. And we'll have a whole lecture on NP space versus P space. The space used by the algorithm is bounded by a polynomial, right? And in space, we're considering the number of cells used, which do not contain the input. Now, if you had to guess, what is the relationship between P and P space? What, which one contains which one, right? P, P space. And I ask this because everyone gets this wrong every single time, including me, and I have to think manually about this. What is the relationship between P and P space? Again, not algorithms, but problems. Consider a problem solvable in polynomial time. Consider if it is solvable in polynomial space, or consider a problem solvable in polynomial space if it's necessarily solvable in polynomial time. Which contains which, if any, or if they're disjoint? Like, like I, I would hope it looks like that, but probably not like this. That would be like a disaster, right? I would think P space is a subset of P. I knew someone would say that, because it's wrong. Including me. I say this, I, I get this one mixed up all the time. Uh, and the convention has to do because we think algorithmically, but we're talking about problems, okay? The way you separate it is you take an algorithm which uses, you construct a language which uses, um, is it, well, you, actually, P, it's actually, it's actually the case that P is a subset. Is that what you said? You said P space is in P, right? I said, I said, flip it. Okay. P is actually a subset of P space. If an algorithm uses polynomial time, it does not have time to write down more than exponential space. So it must be the case that P is in P space. If this is strict or not, is as big of an open question as P versus NP. And we'll relate that question of P versus P space back to P versus NP in like five minutes. But just know P is a subset of P space. Uh, intuitively, like, it feels like the containment should be strict for the same reason P does not equal NP. You could imagine an algorithm which uses polynomial space but exponential time. That would put it, like, here, right? That would mean, like, what are those weird depth-first search algorithms? No, 
divide and conquer algorithms that don't use much space, that use like the the, the space algorithms are like the dynamic programming ones. So you, you trade off some time for some space, right? So like memoization or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but, and, and we can't prove that there aren't slower algorithms for those problems. But there are some problems that seem like the algorithms for them are just the exponential time ones with constant space, right? So certainly in P space and then exponential time not in P, right? That's the intuition. Um, L is an interesting class, and this is, and it's funny you just said the word memoization. This is just space log. Um, logarithmic space is L. Now, L is an interesting class because it's kind of like a better version of constant space than constant space, okay? L is a class of languages which is like the problems which are solvable without using memoization or, and without using dynamic programming. Because logarithmic space is not constant space. Logarithmic space is just enough space to do counters for variables, right? If you have, and it takes log n bits to store the counter. So you can do for loops for programs to decide languages in L, but not much more. That's, so it's a very small class. Um, so just to give you a chain here, we know that L is a subset of the class NL. And ML is non-deterministic logarithmic space. I'm just going to hit you with a thousand names in like a second. Now, NL, we know, is a subset of P. Why do we know NL is a subset of P? And I'm, again, I'm just going to overstate facts here. There's a complete problem for NL, and it turns out to be in P. That's it. So wherever a complete problem goes, so does the rest of it. We know that P is a subset of NP. We just proved that. And actually, we know that P is a subset of P space. We don't know if it's strict. But why is NP a subset of P space? This is a, not an easy question at all, I think. But it's, you know the answer, it's, it, it's, it gets embedded. Why is NP a subset of P space? There's actually three good answers for this one, I think. So it's saying that every problem that can be solved in, um, as part of NP can be solved requiring using polynomial space. Yes. Oh, but you could still, is NP still NP time? Yeah, yeah. it's still polynomial time. So that, that's one answer. Certainly, uh, uh, the, the fact that the non-deterministic machine has this ultimate guessing power does not give it the power to use super polynomial space. It still can only write down polynomial many things. One solution. Another solution was the polynomial time verifying thing, because the thing uses polynomial type time deterministically. It has to use polynomial space. And the only thing you have to account for is the fact that the witness is polynomial sized, which is fine. The final answer is that, we'll prove it later, but sat is NP-complete. Can you give a polynomial space algorithm for sat? If where goes sat goes the rest of NP. We'll talk about SAT again extensively, but SAT is a representative of all of NP. So wherever it goes SAT goes all of NP. If you can give a polynomial space algorithm for SAT, you've given a polynomial, you've proven that NP is in P space. What is a polynomial space algorithm for SAT? Space complexity, again, very weird, slightly different than time complexity. So not only is sat in P space, but sat is in linear space. Here's the, here's the algorithm to solve sat in linear space. The cool part about P space complexity stuff is you get to throw away any use of time. You don't care about time at all. So consider the algorithm that on input of formula, brute force searches it. But every time it's brute force searching an assignment, it writes it down. And when it checks the assignment is wrong, it erases it. The space used is no more than the length of the assignment then, which is n variables, right? So it's going to be linear space. Uh, that's the other cool proof for that one. Now, certainly, uh, this is going to be in uh, NP space, right? You guys see why that one's true? 
generalization of non-determinism. We'll prove this, but it turns out that we know that P space equals NP space. So this is actually equal. That's called Savage's theorem. We'll have a lecture on that. But it turns out that although we can't prove P versus NP, uh, we can't separate them. We can actually show that non-determinism gives no power with respect to space complexity. It's explicitly a time thing. It's sort of independent of the, of the, of the effect of, uh, on space used. P space equals NP space. The, the, when you perform the transformation, the polynomial itself does change, but the fact that polynomials are closed is you get to uh, be there. And then I'm just going to write some more things and not justify this. It turns out that any uh, language which is decidable in non-deterministic polynomial space is decidable in uh, deterministic exponential time. So we'll call X deterministic exponential time. Um, Okay, now I want to conclude uh, with some remarks about um, how difficult of a problem NP versus NP is and how it actually kind of has nothing to do with uh, NP and P itself. I mean, of course, it, it does, but it's actually connected to many other problems through weird kind of connections. Like, we would not expect that kind of relationship to... Uh, produce itself. So considering our chain here, I claim we have the following um, subset. We have L is a subset of P, which is a subset of NP, which is a subset of P space. We agree on this one. Um, however, we know, I haven't said why, but we know that L is a strict subset uh, P space. So these are two space complexity classes. Classes that have the same resource are kind of easy to compare, it turns out. So you can actually separate logarithmic space from P space. You can prove algorithms that use, log that use P space. There is no algorithm which uses logarithmic space. That's provable, it turns out. It's also provable by diagonalization. You can like separate these two by con constructing a language. And we'll have a whole lecture on how to do that. But it's, I like saying the word diagonalization. So you, you can put something in P space, which is explicitly built to be different than everything that's logarithmically spaced. We know these are true. These two statements are true. The first is a sequence of chains. The bottom is also true. But the bottom is the endpoints of the chain. That means not all the things in the chain can be equal. So we have a way to prove P, P equals NP. So if, uh, if you prove that anything which is uh, provable in polynomial time has a logarithmic space algorithm, and you prove that uh, anything that has a polynomial space algorithm has a polynomial time algorithm, I'll put it this way, because half the containments are free. If you can prove anything uh, which is a polynomial time algorithm has a logarithmic space algorithm, and anything that has a poly polynomial space algorithm has a polynomial time algorithm, you get these two to be equalities. And because we know the chain must be strict, we get that P does not equal NP for free. Uh, you get P does not equal NP uh, for free. So because we can't really prove P does not equal NP, these problems are as hard as P does not equal NP, right? Because if you could prove them, congrats, you've proven the thing. Um, here's another chain, and we'll do the, a, a similar, similar approach. We know that P is a subset of NP, and we know that P is a subset, excuse me, NP is a subset of XP. Why is, so NP is a subset of XP because you could follow the chain. But without the chain, why is NP a subset of XP? I'm asking this because I actually forgot to mention it. I was supposed to mention this like five minutes ago. I just remembered that I, I forgot to mention it. So NP is the class of problem. NP equals NPV. Yes. So NP is the class of problems that can be verified in exponential time? Polynomial time. Oh, polynomial time, sorry. Right, so you just... It's going to be the bit flipping argument again, but say the answer is some bits. You keep flipping the bits, and then you verify each bit in polynomial time. Oh, I see what you're saying. 
I see. Um, I, that feels like an answer to a different question. So I guess I guess what I'm asking: Why is NP? Consider anything that is. You can choose whatever definition you want. You can choose a non-deterministic verifiable definition. You can choose. A, excuse me. You can choose the non-deterministic solvable definition or the deterministic verifiable definition. Prove for either definition that those are deterministically solvable. Right? Excuse me. Exponential solvable. So exponential is very bad algorithms, right? Only bad algorithms are exponential time. So give me a bad algorithm for, for NP. So the two things I would think of is, first off, uh, sat is NP complete. So where it goes sat goes NP. So I can give you an exponential time algorithm for sat, and that would be sufficient for proving NP is a subset of XP. What is an exponential time algorithm for sat? Check all the variables. N variables to the N steps. Perfect. Cool. Um, that's one proof. The second proof is the fact that, and the reason I said this, I forgot to mention it, we proved that the non-deterministic Turing machine was Turing complete using BFS, okay? But if you were to take a non-deterministic Turing machine and simulate it deterministically, you wouldn't get something. You would get something maybe that looks like the NFA and DFA construction, right? So to simulate an NTM on a DTM takes exponential blow up. So given an, a polynomial time non-deterministic Turing machine, you have a deterministic version of it. You de non determinify it. But it costs an exponential blow up in that simulation. Right. Do you recall the, the proof we did on the first day of class where we proved that every NFA has a DFA of exponentially many more states? There was an exponential blow up involved. We were able to be satisfied with that for the NFA and DFA case because finite was fine. Exponentially more of a finite number was finite, and so it's still a finite object. DFA. That's not really true in the Turing machine sense because you still get you still get an exponential blow up, uh, which is sufficient to put it in NP, but it's still kind of sad. And it, we don't know a, a better way to simulate a non-deterministic Turing machine deterministically. Just to be clear, what I'm saying is, given it, we gave the verifier definition, sad or whatever. But take a non-deterministic Turing machine. So you have this magic device. You want to have a deterministic machine that gives the same answers. The way you do that is you pretend you're the machine, but you have to perform the BFS on it. So when it comes to the fork in the road, it's allowed to make the choice because it's magic. You don't get to, you don't have that magic. So to catch up, you have to take exponential time because for, for all the, the deep things it's able to ignore, you have to perform all that search yourself. You have to do some complicated backtracking and so on. And it turns out backtracking an exponentially large tree, finding the, a path in the tree is going to be polynomial time. Searching the whole tree is going to be exponential. So that's the second proof of that. Now, the reason I mention that is although we cannot separate P from NP, and this is why it's important I thought we separate, we, do, we talk about P and XP, NP and XP separately, is the fact that we know that P does not equal XP. Why is P in XP, by the way? Kind of like a transitivity? Yeah, basically. If it's in polynomial, right? So like the definition is looks like this. So if the definition of XP, if it's if there's an algorithm that runs in exponential time, take the polynomial time algorithms and just like had them, and then it, now it's in exponential time, right? So it's like above it, sort of, right? This contains linear time and so on. Right. Um, right. Uh, but it, we we can actually prove it's strict, and we will later. But by the similar chain argument, we know one of the following. So if you can actually s prove that NP is equal to XP, uh, we know that P does not equal XP. So if you prove NP equals XP, then you get that uh, NP, that, then you get that uh, P does not equal NP. Right? And it's really easy for us to conflate the fact that XP and P are similar. But in this class, when we're doing an, a more exact science, they're not. Algorithms is more than finite. Um, 
So here's a way for you to win a million dollars. Prove that NP equals XP. And then you get uh, P does not equal NP for free. What that also means is that proving that NP does not equal XP is as hard of a problem as proving uh, P does not equal NP. So we, NP, P versus NP is one problem, but it's actually an entire web of related problems that are just as hard and just as crazy and just as complicated. And, uh, you know, it's really the, th it really is like a, we were able to define these objects. We were able to define these classes. And then we weren't able to do anything about it. Like, we were just able to say that they have some loose containments, but we weren't able to say those containments were strict. We were able to do a hierarchy when we talked about, like, you know, regular languages, context-free languages. We were able to separate these quite well. We have no ability to separate any of these things. I mean, this is, we have some very trivial results. We don't have anything else. They're all, all the problems are related. Perhaps not bidirectionally, but, you know, everything is connected. And uh, that's sort of what makes the theory beautiful is because it's really hard. And we don't know the answers to anything. All right, I think that's, let me just double check. Oh, yeah, I have a list of characterizations of the P versus NP problem. I don't remember if these are true, but I wrote them down in my notes, so they probably are. Um, here, here's, here's some many equivalent ways that you could prove, you could uh, resolve a problem. Uh, you could prove the existence of or non-existence of one-way functions. We talked about that. You could show a super, polyno super polynomial lower bound or polynomial time algorithm for any individual NP-complete problem. So a polynomial time algorithm for SAT would prove P equals NP. If you can prove SAT requires exponential time, you've proved P separates NP. Um, if you gave a reduction from 3 sat to 2 sat, which seems very simple, um, if you can prove that random, random generators are indistinguishable from pseudo-random ones, uh, if you could prove that every property expressible by a second-order existential statement is also expressible in first-order logic with the least fixed-point operator, and there is no polynomially bounded uh, propositional proof system. There's many, many characterizations from many, many fields that have nothing to do with structural complexity yet are related uh, to this problem. All right, any questions?